This is Duke University. All right, well, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Um, welcome, thank you for coming. I'm Fritz Mayer, uh, the director of POLIS, Duke Center for Political uh, Leadership, Innovation, and Service. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Congressman Seth Moulton to Duke. So welcome, Congressman. Thank you very much. Um, 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 many of you probably know his biography, but uh, Congressman Moulton um, was an undergrad at, uh, I think we, we call it the, the Duke of New England um, <laughs> at Harvard, um, and uh, uh, studied physics there, but uh, also Everybody found- in life who, uh, <laughs> For everybody in life who sees my resume and not my transcript, I sound very smart. Yeah. <laughs> Harvard physics degree. Very impressive. Um, um, and there, but you also found time for public service um, uh, at uh, Harvard. Maybe we'll talk a bit about uh, his mentor, Peter Gomes, who was a remarkable uh, figure at, at, at Harvard, the reverend uh, of the, the minister at, the, at Memorial Church at, at Harvard. But then he did what very, very few Harvard grads, or I would say Duke grads, choose to do, which is he decided to enlist in the, in the Marines and served four tours of duty in Iraq, um, twice decorated, um, which is uh, quite unusual for someone coming out of Harvard, I think, and we're going to talk a bit about that. Um, uh, came back to Massachusetts and got a master's uh, dual degree, I guess, an MBA and an MPP degree, which, um, which we share, uh, from the Kennedy School. Uh, and then, in, uh, I guess, in, in, in 2013, decided to run for Congress, uh, ran in, in 2014 against a, a longtime uh, in, incumbent, uh, John Tierney, um, Democrat, um, challenged him, uh, defeated him, and then won the general election, and now is in his second term uh, is representing the 6th District uh, in, of Massachusetts in the United States House of Representatives. Um, so um, quite a biography for someone as young as the uh, congressman, to be sure. Uh, in in, in uh, Congress, really known uh, for your willingness to work across the aisle, um, uh, have very high ratings for bipartisanship, and we'll perhaps talk a bit of, about that um, as well as well as um, um, uh, a great interest in uh, recruiting young people and new candidates, and particularly veterans, um, to, to uh, run for office and, and to join the, and to be members of Congress. So once again, we're thrilled to have you here, and look forward Thanks. to the conversation, and, and welcome. Um, it's an honor to be here. I mean, let me just say, this is, this is actually my first visit to the Duke campus. I have a lot of friends who've gone here. Uh, one of the newest members of my team, Zach Elder, graduated in 2015. Where is Zach? There he is. Um, so uh, it's, it's really great to, to be here. And I'm looking forward to your questions. So we'll have a bit of a conversation, yep, but then we'll absolutely. get to take a bunch of questions. Yeah, that's the drill exactly. And a uh, uh, nice shout out to Zach, who was my teaching assistant, head TA for PPS 155, our core course at, uh, in public policy. So welcome back, uh, Zach. Seth, let me, let, me, let me start with what I alluded to. The decision you made uh, to, I'm sure you had uh, other options, um, but a decision that not many people would make uh, to, to join the military. Uh, what, what, what led you to that? What, where did that come from? You know, when I got to college, I realized that I'd had tremendous opportunities in life. And you know, I was born in a great country. I was able to go to, to great schools with, with loans and everything to get, to get by. But I hadn't really done anything to give back. You know, I'd never really been, I wasn't a community service jock. I wasn't someone who um, had done a lot of volunteer work. And so when I got, when I approached graduation, I said, you know, I want to do something. And I looked at different options. I looked at the Peace Corps. I looked at teaching overseas. Mm -hmm. But I was really influenced by the experience I had um, with Peter Gomes in, mm. in the Memorial mm. Church. Mm. And, and he was someone who talked a lot about the importance of service, about how it's not enough just to believe in service or support others who serve. You ought to find a way to give back yourself. And this is a church that was built in memory of the Harvard graduates who mm. died in World War I. Mm. And then they added this massive wall for all the Harvard graduates who died in World War II. And then they added a tiny little plaque for all the very few Harvard graduates who died in the Vietnam War, which is a story in and of itself. 
right? I mean, how so many went to serve in World War II and so few went to serve in Vietnam. But being in that place, uh, I sort of looked at these young men and women who decided to put their lives on the line for the country as in some ways a sort of you know, ultimate way to serve. And I decided that I would do that, wanted to do my part too. But, but I graduated in June of 2001, so I didn't expect there to be a war. I didn't think right. that um, I'd end up in Iraq in a couple of years. I had no idea that that's where it w life would take me. Uh, um, but it did. And, and uh, just to, to, uh, to follow up then on, on that, so I'm, I'm, you know, how did, I mean, you had uh, incredible experiences there. You've been critical of the way in which the operation was conducted, of the occupation was conducted. Um, yet you served for those four terms. You had extensive experience in combat and, 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 and watching the whole operation. How, how has that shaped your views now about military policy, about intervention, about the, how much we should spend on the military now that you're in Congress? Well, I mean, just to start at the beginning, I mean, I, I didn't come into the military because I was a warmonger. You know, in fact, my yeah. parents were both, my parents went to Brown and graduated from 1968, 1968 mm -hmm. and 1970. So you can imagine where they were on the ideological yeah. spectrum, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, shortly after I joined, you know, because 9-11 happened, and this was back when the war was very popular, uh, a, a Boston paper asked my, my mom, you know, aren't you proud of your son for going out there to fight? Um, you know, a lot of my, mm. my colleagues, a lot of my friends in, in school had got, were literally on Wall Street during 9-11, that's where they had gone to work. And so they saw this firsthand, but I was one of the only ones who was actually in a position to do something about it. They thought I was crazy to join the military, then all of a sudden there were lines outside a recruiting station. So the paper asked my mom, and, and you know, aren't you proud of your son Seth? And my mom said, quote, I would only have been more disappointed in Seth if he had chosen a life of crime. <laughs> so not a lot of parental support for this decision. They were very, anti-war to the point of really being anti-military. And uh, so that's sort of the context and the background that I went in. So I was, you know, I was a skeptic. Now I'll tell you, going into Iraq, we believed the intelligence, you know? We, we thought Saddam was really, really bad, which he was. We also thought that he had chemical weapons he was gonna use against us. I mean, we weren't wearing these rubber suits for show or because you really no. want to wear a rubber suit in a desert. No, I mean, we thought we were gonna get hit with chemical weapons. Um, but we also, we took bets, the lieutenants in my company, about whether we would actually invade when we were standing in Kuwait, you know, um, a, f a few weeks before. And I thought, no, I said, there's no way Bush is actually gonna do this, this is crazy. Yeah. You know, it's a show of force or something, but we're not gonna really go through with it. And then we did. And initially it went really well, but over the course of the war, uh, we made an awful lot of mistakes and things really started to go downhill. And I wasn't afraid to speak out about it. I uh, actually did an interview on a, on a movie in 2007, yeah. right in the heart right. of the war, and was very critical of what we were doing and the decisions that the administration uh, was making and the lives that were lost. And, and ultimately, although I didn't come out of that experience and say, okay, I'm gonna run for Congress to fix this, you know, when I, when I decided to run, I thought back on that and, and it really informed why I'm doing this. Well, I didn't grow up interested in politics, yeah. but I saw the consequences of failed leadership in Washington when I was on the ground in Iraq in very, very human terms. People lost their lives. So was that the moment you, you started thinking about the possibility, or was that, did that come later? No, I mean, running for Congress? you know, there was, a, there was a day in 2004, at the end of a pretty rough day, when a, when a young Marine of my platoon, a corporal, Corporal Castro, came up to me and he said, um, you know, sir, you ought to run for Congress someday so that this shit doesn't happen again. But he didn't convince me because I came back, I went to business school, and, you know, like every aspiring Massachusetts politician, I took a job in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so this is not what I had expected to do. But, um, you know, credit for this decision uh, has a lot to do with an amazing woman named Emily Cherniak who founded a nonprofit called New Politics mm. that's trying to get national service veterans, so not just military veterans, but Peace, Peace Corps, Teach for America, mm. national service veterans to run for office to try to change our politics. And she called me up when I was working in Dallas and said, you ought to think about running. And I, I said, what the hell are you talking about? I'm living yeah, in Texas. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, some, I, I was telling this story to someone I was having dinner with that night. And naturally, my friend asked, well, who are you going to run against? And I couldn't even remember the name of my congressman. So that's how <laughs> sort of out of touch I was. But I thought back to what Corporal Castro told me. And I thought about how, how bad it was to be on the ground in a war where people in Washington were making political decisions that affected our lives and really didn't understand what we were going through. And I said, you know what? It's never going to change if people aren't willing to step up and run and try to change it. Well, that's, that's terrific. Now, you're in that business as well, in the sense that you're now, you have a PAC that is uh, trying to help uh, others with similar profiles to yours. I think 19 candidates you're supporting, 18 of them maybe are, are veterans, is that right? Yeah, well, they're all veterans. Um, it, it turns out that most are military veterans. One's uh, a veteran of the CIA, but we're open oh, to all, veterans, all national uh, 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 service veterans. You know, this is just my way of trying to um, kind of fight back after November 2016. And when you have even Republicans right now, like David Jolly, my former colleague from Florida, saying the right thing for America is for Democrats to take back the House of Representatives to put a check on the president, you know, to restore some balance to Washington, um, I decided I've got to do what I can to help. And so I decided to focus on swing districts, the districts that we really need to win if we're going to take back the House. And my niche is kind of veterans, so I said, all right, I'm going to go find some veterans who I think are good for our politics, but also are just really good at winning, winning swing yeah. districts. And uh, we've got 19 of them running, including Dan McCready right Dan down McCready, here in yeah. uh, North Carolina, who's taking on uh, Robert Pittenger and is doing, doing really well. So, really well. so why do we need, uh, I think it's the case that we're at the lowest number of veterans in the Congress in, in our history. That's perhaps. right. We've never had fewer. Uh, what, what, what is it that being a veteran uh, you know, brings to the table? Why, why is it important that there be veterans in the Congress? Well, look, I mean, first of all, I, it, it shouldn't be a litmus test. I mean, by no means of should course, you have yeah. to be a veteran to run. Um, we need a diverse Congress that represents our diverse country, which, by the way, we don't really have right now. Um, this is a total sidebar, but I, um, I got in this, this really heated debate with a Republican once. And uh, in a bipartisan working group, which usually doesn't have really heated debates. And uh, he was kind of a real jerk to me, to be honest. But then he sent a note. And it really, it was a great political lesson for a young member of Congress because I really, I, wow, this, this is a pretty classy move. And I felt better. So I went up on the floor uh, when we were voting later that day to thank him for this note. And I said, hey, you know, thank you very much for, that meant a lot to me. And he looked at me kind of like, uh, Okay, you know, no, I mean, really, it was it was a meaningful. You know, you took the time yeah. to write that, and I, you know, no hard feelings or whatever. It didn't really seem to know what he was, what I was talking about. And then about thirty seconds later, I w I walked up to the other old white man who looked just like him and thanked him for the note he said. <laughs> so that's what a lot of Congress looks like right now. <laughs> uh, but what <laughs> veterans bring. To get back to your question, <laughs> that's right. I just, I mean, it's the old white man thing that got me. So, but that's yeah. all right. <laughs> Sorry, we all look um, like. Yeah. The what 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 veterans bring is this experience of having, you know, put the country first, yeah. and really made some sacrifices uh, that are a lot bigger deal. And when you've faced getting shot at before, I think it's easier to take a tough political decision and do the right thing for the country rather than the right thing for your political party or your own political future. So there are always exceptions to the rule, you know, and I could tell you about some veterans in Congress right now who are not bipartisan at all and I would love to see lose their job. But the vast majority are really willing to work across the aisle. There's statistics that support yeah. this too. Yeah. And, and I just find, you know, when, when I need to find someone on the Republican side to work on a bill, I often go to a veteran because I think they're willing to be bipartisan. And we have this shared experience. And the old guys say that you know, this is what was lost after World War II, um, that in the 50s and 60s when Congress was in some ways the most productive it's ever been, so many members of Congress had that shared experience. Yeah. We don't have that anymore. Yeah, no, it's, uh, as I, we were talking beforehand, I, I spent a little time in the Congress and, and so the tail end of that era in a sense where people really knew each other uh, and now uh, there's so little ideological overlap. It's so polarized. Uh, but you're, on, you're, we, you're talking about it now. We, I mentioned it in the introduction. You're unusual or, or, or one of the few who seems to be really dedicated to, to trying to reach across the aisle. I guess the question I have is, is how do you decide when, you, when to do that? And when, you know, when, when do you compromise and, and when do you fight? Well, it's a great question. I mean, 
there's not an easy answer here, but my view is you don't ever compromise your principles, but you've got to be willing to make compromises to advance, you know, to advance legislation. You know, so, um, so on, you know, like, look, I, I feel very strongly about gay rights. You know, my brother's gay. I'm not, I'm not gonna compromise on that, on mm -hmm. that principle. Um, but there are places where, you know, we've got to, to move things forward. And, and I'll give you an example, and this might sound like sort of in the weeds, but some of the hardest bills we vote on <clears throat> are the ones that are not black and white issues. They're mm -hmm. just kind of gray. We had a, a, a vote come up on a bill to do GMO labeling. And a lot of people care about GMOs now and whether they're in their food. And this was debated back and forth and different proposals were, were pushed forward. And ultimately, the bill that came to the floor after a lot of bipartisan compromise had, was, was sort of everybody hated it. Mm. Because for Republicans, it went too far because you know, they don't want to have you know, people scared of GMOs. Uh, for liberal Democrats, it didn't go far enough because basically the compromise was rather than put you know, in fluorescent letters, GMOs do not buy or something, which is what probably some people would have liked. Um, it had a, a, like a QR code mm. where you could get more information. You know, I mean, the, 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 the proponent said, look, n there's not gonna be any other thing on the, uh, stuff on the shelf that has massive QR codes, so it's gonna be a pretty good sign. But I certainly would have preferred if it just was a little bit more transparent and just said, this has GMOs. But the reality is w was that if we didn't vote to get this passed, there would be no labeling whatsoever. Mm. So I voted for it. And then a lot of people on the left got really angry because they said, well, how could you vote for this QR code when we wanted something that was you know, flashing neon sign? The reality is was we didn't have the option to get a flashing, ne flashing neon sign, even if that's what I would have preferred. Um, so those are sometimes the tough votes, yeah. just these little stuff in the weeds where it's a lot of gray. You know, what, where do you compromise to, um, to just do something that makes things a little incrementally better for the country? Well, let me take you on a couple of issues which, which, where this might arise. Yeah. So, um, well, well, the obvious really right now is guns uh, and gun control in the, uh, in the wake of uh, Parkland. Um, you've been on the record in, uh, of saying uh, no citizen should have one of these weapons with respect to the assault weapons. You've sponsored, I think, uh, uh, the bump stock, any bump stock legislation. I co-authored it, yeah. I co-authored it. Um, is this a different moment? Are we, are we replaying the same thing that we have seen repeatedly in the past? You know, I'm a big believer that there will be a tipping point some, at some time in our nation's history. I don't know if we've reached it or not. You know, it feels like it, but it also felt like after Vegas, we were gonna get the bump stock ban passed. Um, the, 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 the bill that I co-authored has more Republicans signed on than any b gun bill in, in, in as long as anyone can remember. And the number of Republicans who came up to me on the floor and said, I'm not gonna put my name on it right now, but I will vote for it, leaves me confident that we could have gotten it passed. But Speaker Ryan just wouldn't even bring it up to a vote because the NRA told him not to. So do you see, so there's some space that there, at least potentially, for a bipartisan, there's a bipartisan approach to it, but, but you're-, you're There is, and, and it- Do you and see it, it loosening at all? <laughs> Look, it is a good example of, a, of, a, of an issue where, uh, you know, I'm never gonna get exactly what I want, and Republicans are gonna get to have to give up some things on this, but there are absolutely things that we can do in a bipartisan way to make the country safer. And when 98% when of America thinks that we ought to have universal background checks for purchasing guns, like it shouldn't be that hard, you know? It's not a secret what's yeah. going on here, 98%, yeah. not 98% of yeah. you know, yeah, liberal no, Democrats, sure. it's 98% of Americans, including I think it's 97% of gun owners think that we ought to have universal background checks. Now, I would like to see a background check system like we have in J they have in Japan, uh -huh. which is like, I mean, you, you go through a mental health exam before you're allowed to have a gun. Like, I think that would make the country a lot safer. You know, there's a reason why Japan, which is about a third of our population, has about 10 shooting deaths a year. Yeah, we have 33,000, okay? Yeah. So that's what I would like. But if we can just get a little bit better background check system than we have today, it's certainly a step in the right direction. We should take that step. Uh, President Trump is, well, it's hard to know what, where he is on this, but he's, he's, he's you know. He's, he's, no, we're no, no worries on that. Oh, we won't go there. Um, um, <laughs> immigration, another issue that you've been um, yeah. actually quite, quite strong on, uh, the, the refugee ban you really 
you really said was cruel and unusual, I think. Um, uh, you've, uh, I believe you brought an immigrant to the State of the Union I did. Uh, address. Yeah. Um, so and I, oh, I brought, a, I brought a, uh, an immigrant to the most recent State of the Union. Um, I brought a Syrian refugee um, to you know, the State of the Union a year ago when this was like really, uh. you know, really the big issue. And, um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you that uh, during the Syrian refugee debate, when actually a lot of Democrats crossed the aisle to vote against um, you know, me on this mm. issue and other Democrats who supported continuing immigration, there was one Republican in the entire United States House of Representatives to support the Syrians, to support continued immigration. And it was a veteran who'd served on the ground in Iraq and understood this issue. Mm. And he's actually a very conservative Republican. He's not, if you had just said, who's going to be the one Republican who stands up for Syrian refugees, you never would have picked this guy. He would have been like number 200 on your list. Mm. But he gets it because he's on the ground and he had the courage, the political courage, to stand up and speak out. So I appreciate yeah. the credit for, for, for me, you know, for speaking out because it was actually unpopular even in Massachusetts when I did so. But it was way more unpopular in Oklahoma. And he should get a lot more credit than me. Now are we gonna are we gonna get there on DACA? Is 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 this gonna get solved? You know, I don't know. Um, I, I would certainly like to think that yes, we will come up with some sort of solution. But it's very difficult working with this president because there were two or three bipartisan proposals that we'd worked out in Congress and brought to his desk to the White House, and at at various times, he had said he would support them, and then he changed his mind and said he wouldn't. And so it's just very difficult to have an honest agreement with someone when you can't even have an honest debate. And so it's uh, you know this could very well go up to the to the deadline. So it's remarkable. Let me let me ask you about um, and we're we're just a warning. In a few minutes, we'll open up for questions, and there are a couple of mics here. So 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 uh, um, get your questions ready and be and 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 be ready. Um, it's tempting, I think, for Democrats right now to be just anti-Trump 24-7. And, um, yeah. um, but I, I know you've said that Democrats just can't be against Trump. That's a, that's a trap that we need to stand for something. And um, I believe you said you're not running for president unless you want to say something tonight. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, yeah. We, no, we'll no, we'll no, take a straw poll here. But you... But, <laughs> But but you are interested, I know, in, in kind of remaking the Democratic Party yeah, yeah. and reshaping it. And so, my my question is, aside from being against Trump, what 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 are the major things that you, you know, what are the big planks in that platform? What are Democrat? What should Democrats stand for? Right well, now? let me start by just explaining why I want to do this. What's my motivation yeah. here? And 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 there's really, I think, it comes down to two things. Uh, I think the Republicans right now are running this country into the ground. And we need to do this for the country. But I also think that if we're going to do this, we need to start winning again. And so a lot, about, a lot of this is just about, you know, let's win. Uh, Democrats right now are in the, the worst position electorally since the 1920s in the House, the Senate, the White House, and in state legislatures across the country where we've lost over 1,000 seats in the, last, in the last decade. So, you know, Einstein's definition of insanity is continuing to do the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, right? Like, Let's wake up, Democrats, look ourselves in the mirror and recognize, yeah, Trump's really bad, but we've also lost. You know, Trump's really bad, but they still voted for him and not us. Like, we've got to make some changes ourselves. And I believe we should be talking about where we want to take the country, not just how bad the Republicans are, because you could talk about Trump all day if there were 48 hours in the day. But let's talk about what we're going to do. You know, let's talk, what it, talk about what it means to really have equal opportunity in this country. You know, America's never been a, a land of equal results, but we've, we're enshrined in our Constitution. We're supposed to be a land of equal opportunity. You know, where everybody, no matter where you're born, or what your bank account says, you know, we give you a set of stairs and you can start climbing. You know, what does it mean to, to really tackle the economic challenges that are leaving a tremendous number of people out of work and disillusioned and so angry that they would vote for a guy who rides in the golden elevator? to be their president? You know, how do we make sure that everybody in America, no matter where you live, has a meaningful role to play in the economy of the future? 
not the economy of the past. We're not going to fix this by going back into the coal mines like Trump says. We got to embrace it. We got to realize that immigrants aren't taking jobs, robots are. That's why people are losing their jobs. So what do we do about that? How do we fix that? And how do we make sure that everybody in America has a chance? You know, those are the things we should be, we should be talking about. We're, we're, we're worried about a, uh, you know, a, a several million um, innocent Americans losing their immigration status. Why don't we talk about the 28 million Americans who still don't have health care and our plan to make sure they do? You know, that, those are the things I think that we need to be talking about as a party. Well, so, uh, so let me press you a little bit on, on that because uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. But then I guess the, the question is, you know, let's take the uh, economic situation in which sure. uh, a, a huge swath of the country has been left behind. We know the, the incredible increase in inequality. The, the gains of this economy have gone to the top. Um, what, what you, know, aside, you oppose the tax bill, and so that's one, what, you know, which did not make uh, things better, probably on, on that front. Um, but Actually what made else? Things a lot worse. Yeah. Uh, what else should we be doing in to to tackle that's a, to tackle that issue? Let's take that one. Well, there's a few things. One thing we should be doing is we should be investing in infrastructure, but not 1950s infrastructure, which is what the infrastructure proposals. You know, just let's add some more lanes to highways. Yeah. I mean, other countries are literally reducing lanes on highways. We're tra talking about adding them. You know, if you're in South Bend, Indiana, you need modern infrastructure to get access to the same jobs. That means you need broadband access so that you have the same chance of getting a job in Chicago as someone in downtown Chicago, or a job on the internet, rather. It also should mean high-speed rail, because then if there's actually a, a physical job opening in Chicago, you can get there in 30 minutes from South Bend as opposed to a three-hour drive. Every other country in the world has it. We don't have it here. You know, I, 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 I could bear, I, I had to drive from Austin to Dallas yesterday because um, of flight problems. That should be a 30 minute ride on a high speed train. It was a three hour drive or a broken airline ride. So like we're way behind folks and this is leaving people behind on the ground. Another thing we need to do is we need to really look at education because you guys are all going to graduate soon. And, and you're fortunate to go to one of the best educational institutions in the world here at Duke. And yet, even if Duke perfectly prepares you for the economy of today, half the jobs in 2040 do not even exist today. We don't know what they are. So sort of by definition, now, you aren't all going to be evenly spread across the economic spectrum, but, but half of you are going to need to learn new skills 20 years from now just to be in the economy. So just teaching people, educating Americans until they're you know, 18 or 22 isn't going to cut it anymore. So like I have a bill to, to establish uh, lifelong learning accounts. You know, so like a, like a 401k, you can tap into educational savings if you need them when you're 50, not just when you're trying to get a college loan at 18. So these are the kinds of things we should be talking about to move the country forward. And a quick word on the tax bill. The tax bill gives benefits to the biggest corporations and the people who are already the wealthiest in America. That's the opposite of what we need to do. It makes inequality worse. But even more importantly, all the new job growth, the new jobs that are actually you know, thriving in this automated economy, they're all coming from small and growing businesses. So if we want to pass a good tax plan, it should be one that incentivizes the new businesses, not the old established corporations. But that's the opposite of what the Republicans just passed. So we got a lot of work to do and a lot of challenges, but these are some of the things that we can do to, to help this economic challenge. That's great. I'm sure people want to follow up on that. Let me you know, just ask one last question, and then we will open up. For, so um, the question is, will the Democrats take, retake the House you know, November 6th? We have a darn good chance, but we can't rest on our laurels. If we go into November just saying, hey, we did well in Alabama, we did well in Virginia, we've got a governorship in New Jersey, we can just keep doing the same thing. If that's our attitude, it's not going to be enough. I mean, we're at a structural disadvantage because the Republicans have been so effective through their control of state legislators at gerrymandering us. Uh, and so you know, we've got to win Republican districts. And that's, that's, that's hard. I think it's going to be hard with our current leadership team. I think it's going to be hard. So there are changes that we still need to make on the Democratic side of the aisle if we're going to have a better chance in, in November. But can we do it? Yeah, we absolutely can do it. 
And I think it's important for the country. Let me follow up on one piece since you mentioned, mentioned the leadership team. Um, um, you've not been shy about challenging leadership, uh, um, and, and that hasn't always made you maybe the most popular person with some of the Democratic leadership. Why, why, why have you been so critical of the, the leadership in the, of Speaker Pelosi, um, but of, of other leaders in the Democratic Party? Well, look, it's not about personalities. I mean, Leader Pelosi is a, a very nice lady, and, and frankly, she, you know, in her own words, is a master legislator. I mean, we wouldn't have Obamacare without her. She's had an extraordinary career. Uh, but she's been very explicit that her strategy is to just complain about the Republicans and Trump and not have a vision for the future. And, and I don't think that's going to be a winning strategy. She's also, uh, you know, a very effective scapegoat for the Republicans. And a lot of the attacks against her are totally unfair and unjustified, but they're nonetheless unbelievably effective in these races. Uh, one of my candidates is Connor Lamb, who's running up in a special election in Pennsylvania. If you don't know about it, it's a really important special election coming up in March, and we have a chance of taking a solidly Republican district. He's an amazing candidate. And he actually, on a, you know, by his own volition, has come out and said he's not going to support Pelosi. But all the ads that the Republicans run against him are just about her, because even though they're literally lying because he said that he won't support her, and he therefore has a very easy comeback to the ads, it's literally the most effective argument that they have, that he's just going to do what she says. So that's not fair to her. It's not fair to her politics. But that's the reality we're in. And so if we really want to win, I think we got to make some of these changes. Well, let's, let's, thank you very much. Let, let, let's, let's open up to the audience and, and, and see what, uh, what you want to talk about and pursue with, uh, with uh, Congressman. Uh, so come up to the microphone and uh, uh, keep your questions brief. Uh, and why don't you introduce yourself as well as you, as you come up? Hi, Congressman. My name's Asa. I'm a junior studying computer science. Right. Uh, thanks so much for being here tonight. So you mentioned the NRA had kind of co-opted Ryan into pulling your bill, or not putting your bill on the floor. Right. And I'm curious whether you think that the NRA is strong and has the power to do that because they're able to donate money to candidates, or whether it's really just because the NRA's politics aligns with what representatives see their citizens' uh, politics aligning with. It's a great question, but I think it has mostly to do with the money. Because when you have these polls that show that the vast majority of Americans, you know, I'm not talking about 55% of Americans think we ought to have universal background checks. I'm talking about 98%. So clearly, when these Republicans go back to their districts, even conservative districts, they're hearing from their constituents that, you know, we don't want you to take away the Second Amendment, but we want to have some things that will, some responsible reforms that will make us safe. So there's not really any other explanation than the money. And that's why it's so corrupting to our democratic policy, uh, process. Thanks, Asa. Hi. Hi, Congressman. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, it was great hearing you speak. Um, my name is Leah. I'm a sophomore. And I'm curious about the changes that um, you're saying the Democratic Party needs. Do you think that the Democratic Party needs a change in the types of candidates that run? And if so, could you elaborate on if you're seeing that change happen? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the most obvious thing is that we need to, we're already a way more diverse party than the, than the Republicans, but we've got to reflect the, the, the nation that we represent. And so that's something, I mean, I've worked very hard to try to recruit, um, you know, candidates of color who are veterans to run. We've not been very successful, frankly. It's been really hard. Um, but like, that's something that we need to do a better job of. Uh, there are a lot of women who are excited uh, this year, as, as women should be, because you're getting screwed by this president, all right? And so it's great that so many women are getting involved, um, but that takes, that takes work. You know, there's a, st there's a, a study that showed that um, if, if it takes, uh, if you have to have five conversations with a man to convince him to run for Congress, you have to have 25, five times with a woman to get her to run. I don't know exactly why, but it just shows like, you know, we need to work at this um, to make sure that our Congress is more representative of our country. And one of the biggest ways in which the Congress doesn't represent our country right now is there are not many young people in Congress. You know, it's very easy for a 70-year-old to vote for this tax bill because he, it's almost guaranteed to be a he, um, will get a great little tax cut in the next seven years, and then it's going to expire, and he might expire too, and so, <laughs> you know, nothing to lose. 
but, but we're, we're going to have to foot the bill. Our generation is going to have to foot the bill. You know, so we ought to have the people who are literally invested in our future talk about us. Why did climate change not come up once in the entire 2016 debates? Right? Well, just look at the age of the people debating. Maybe that has something to do with it, right? They're not worried about it, you know? So they're going to be in the ground when it starts warming up. So um, look, that's just, that's, that's one of the ways we need to change things, you know? And I've, look, my parents are at retirement age. Like, I want to support them too. They're counting on Social Security and Medicare. I want to make sure it's there for them. But I also want to make sure it's there for you. And right now, on the path we're headed, it's not going to be. Thank you. Over here. Uh, hey, thanks so much for coming, Congressman. My name is Atib, and I'm a senior. Uh, now, I've heard you reiterate sort of a narrative I've heard from a lot of servicemen and veterans from your generation, which is after 9-11, you were galvanized to duty, you know, to serve your country. And as, as a Muslim American, my post-9-11 story is a lot different. Yeah. Uh, and my relationship with, you know, sort of growing up, uh, my family, like to the extent I can speak for the Muslim American community, we have a very complicated relationship with the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. And I know you've worked a lot on sort of questions about veterans in Congress and also veteran interaction with society. And I'm curious, you know, I had a friend ask me the other day, you know, after proposed grad prospects, why don't you join the military? And it's something I had never even considered, let alone even thought about that's something I wanted to do. So I'm curious, could you talk about uh, just the Muslim American relationship with the American military, if there's prospects for the future, and then also sort of to what extent people in my generation, particularly Muslim Americans, could get involved in the military? Well, I, I think that, you know, one of the reasons why my friend from Oklahoma supports, you know, Syrian refugee immigration is because he has a lot of relationships um, with people from the Middle East, including, um, you know, Muslims and Muslim Americans. So I, I think that in some ways the, the military can be a very good thing in, in, in helping us to bridge that divide. Uh, but obviously, it's a contentious relationship too, and um, you know, there's there's no, you know, I don't think there's any replacement for sort of being out there and on the ground to, to understand the lives of others. Uh, but the U.S. Mil the military hasn't always been perfect in how it's handled these things. Um, you know, one of my heroes from the war is my my translator Muhammad, who uh, uh, grew up in Iraq and uh, was one of the first volunteers to come and, and help us. Uh, we had a sort of interesting uh, relationship because at one point we co-hosted a TV show, uh, and uh, you know, not a single one of you has asked for my autograph. I used to get out, asked for my autograph all the time by these Iraqis. I was like a minor TV star, it was a you know, much bigger deal than being a United States congressman. Um, but uh, um, but he's he's one of my closest friends, and uh, and he's and he's come to America, and I think that my community back home in my hometown where, he's, where he lived for a while has learned a lot about um, relationships with Muslim Americans. Um, but don't get me wrong, we have an awful lot of work to do. I will tell you that m my Muslim friends who have served in the military have had very positive experiences. And so I wouldn't dismiss it just because of the sort of overall um, difficult relationship in the Middle East. So if I may, do you have like specific Please. recruiting advice to, to like if you were to like talk to recruiting officers, not for like me, but for just in general? I'm just curious. Um, if anyone wants to, yeah, if you want just general recruiting advice for anybody, no matter what your background, um, who's joined the military, recognize that the recruiters have, have quotas and goals and you need to do what you want and not just follow what, they, um, what they're trying to, to slot you into. Uh, but, um, but I'll tell you, the best decision of my life was, uh, was to, to join the Marines. And, and, it's been, and it was hard and it was risky. Uh, but it's the best decision that I've made, and you know, sometimes I will tell people, you know, do you like the job that you have? Um, it's this, it's the second job I've had in my life where I really feel like I, I can impact the lives of other people every single day. You know, and even though I was in Iraq, in the Marines, in a war that I disagreed with, my work every single day impacted the lives of other people, of Iraqis, of fellow Americans, and. That's something I really missed when I got out. That's, that's one of the more personal reasons why I decided to, to run for Congress, to, because I really missed public service. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Over here. Hi, Congressman. Thanks for being here today. My name is Mary. I'm a master's in public policy student at Duke, uh, but I also have a master's in accounting, and I worked as an auditor before I came here. And I want to tell you that because I'd like to push back on some of your comments about the corporate tax break and I want you to understand that I'm coming from having worked in private industry. Sure. Uh, so uh, first of all, unless I 
don't understand the bill. Like my understanding is that that corporate tax rate applies to all corporations, large, small. So I, I don't understand why that wouldn't benefit small companies in addition to large ones. Uh, but really, large companies also employ the most people. So I'm from the state of Michigan, and half the people I know work for either GM or Ford. And the fact that there's a plant coming back to Michigan is really good news for the people that I care about. Mm -hmm. And you know, I fully expect that because corporations are getting such a significant cash savings on this tax plan, they're going to invest in new opportunities for growth, and that's going to generate jobs in this country. And more than anything else in the tax bill, which I thought was imperfect, I support the corporate tax break because it has an ability to affect and help more Americans than any individual tax break could, which would be, have a much smaller impact. So can you just help me understand a little bit better why you don't think that that's going to be beneficial for working Americans? Sure. It's a great, great question. I appreciate it very much. Um, and I'm glad you're an accountant. I thought you were going to say we ought to audit the, uh, the Department of Defense, which is another big issue that needs to be done. And we could use your help with that. Uh, definitely use your help. Um, so, so let me just sort of go through uh, th this in a, in a, in a, f in a few steps. Um, first of all, uh, small growth, like startups, don't pay taxes. You know, most of them are, are not at the, at the, you know, when you're pre-revenue and when you're really creating these new innovative jobs, you're not even paying taxes. So sort of by definition, initially, that the, the bill doesn't help them. Uh, and it does really help the big, uh, the, the big corporations. But to the point of investment, the problem is that all the data shows that what you'd like to see these companies do, which is invest in research and invest in their labor force, they're not doing. They're not doing at all. In fact, the, what all the corporations have started doing is just giving one-time bonuses to their employees, which is great when you get $1,000. But if it doesn't raise your salary, wages don't go up. And the biggest thing corporations are doing is just buying back their own stock, which only increases value for shareholders. And so the investors in these corporations, the uber wealthy, are doing really, really well. But it does not help the people, the working Americans who are, who are on the ground. Now, if, if you can get some um, companies coming back to Michigan, you know, that's great. Um, and that has happened in, in, in certain places, but it's not really a result of this, this tax bill. Um, and if you've seen, you know, when the president went to the carrier plant, right, in Indiana and said, hey, we're going to bring all these jobs back, uh, it only took a year and a half for them to go away again. So the data just doesn't support the fact that this will really do what you'd like it to do. And, you know, one of the problems with when it was passed is that we never even had anyone come in to ask these questions. Congress even, never even gave an opportunity for someone like you to submit a question and say, you know, what do experts think will happen with this tax bill? It was passed in the dead of night with scribbled edits in the margins, and many, even Republicans, didn't know what was in it. A lot of Democrats heard what was in it from lobbyists downtown who had obviously been involved in the discussions because they weren't. And, and this is the antithesis of how you should pass legislation. And um, it's one of the reasons why I think it's going to be a bad result. But thanks for your question. Uh, laying aside the process part of it, because I think yeah. that's a completely different argument, I just, it really bothers me when people say that increases in shareholder value only benefit the ultra wealthy because anybody in this room with a 401k is a shareholder in multiple companies or in, you know, S&P 500, uh, sorry, you know, mutual funds. So I really just feel like that's false rhetoric. So if we are boosting stockholder prices, that's a benefiting middle America as well. So I hate to break it to you, but this is the 1%. And the people who are really hurting in this country, they don't have 401ks. They don't ha they're not invested in the stock market. Not every person with 401k is upper middle class. <laughs> I have, my friends aren't the ultra, uber ultra wealthy. My parents aren't the uber ultra wealthy. I'm here on a scholarship. Yeah, I mean, I went to school on a scholarship too. But if you spend some time in middle America and see the, 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 the literally millions of Americans who are really struggling, the stock market's not going to help them. And so it, th this is, I think this is representational of the divide that exists in America today. And, and the people who are really hurting in our economy, you know, th this really is what they need is a better wage. You know, what they need is a job that they can actually, you know, that will, will keep them fully employed. Because a lot of Americans, the unemployment statistics right now are, are pretty misleading because a lot of Americans are just underemployed. You know, they're not doing the job that they used to have. They're not getting paid what they used to get paid. So, I mean, look, I, I hear your argument and, and, you know, sure, are there people in the middle class who have some mutual fund investments? Yes, there are. There are. But there are an awful lot of Americans who are being completely left out. They're the ones who are really hurting. And I think in the long run, 
economists will say, well, smarter than me, that they are ultimately going to, going to, that's going to be the drag on the economy for all of us. Thanks for your answer. Yeah, yeah thank you. Very Thanks. Thoughtful answer. Thanks. Great question. Thanks for the thoughtful question too. Yeah. By the way, are there any Republicans here? A few, yeah, yeah. There's, hey, yeah. thank you, and I really I mean that sincerely. Thank you. I mean, this is such a divided time in American politics. I really sincerely appreciate it that you would come here, a Democrat from Massachusetts, even if you're a Republican. And and I hope you guys ask some questions too. Ask some more tough questions. That's good. Yeah. Congressman, thank you so much for coming. My name is Ethan. I'm a freshman studying political science. So you briefly talked about what direction you want to see the Democratic Party take generally, and there seems to be kind of a divide amongst Democrats, among those who want Democrats to run consistently progressive candidates throughout the country, um, and those who want to run candidates who seem, are seemingly tailored to their districts, so maybe more right-leaning Democrats in right, red states. So I wanted to know what's your opinion on that. Do you think that the Democratic Party should start supporting a, over, uh, like a progressive platform all around, or is there room for candidates who don't necessarily agree with everything that the Democratic Party itself may agree with? Well, do you want to win or not? I mean, the way our system works is that we have a representative system where you represent the interests of your district, and if you're a candidate who doesn't represent those interests, then they're not going to vote for you. So I have, you know, I feel very strongly a lot about a lot of progressive issues, and I want to see them, um, you know, advanced. But I know that we're not even going to get a chance to vote on these issues if, if we don't have a majority in the House. And so the, our system was set up to have representatives who represent their district, and we need to make sure we have candidates who can, who can win these races. I mean, I think that um, rather than think about this big ideological war between one side of the party and the other, what we ought to be doing is uniting the party and broadening the tent. And by the way, what a great opportunity to bring in some, um, some some former Republicans who were totally disillusioned with their party right now and feeling left out. You know, that's how we actually build a majority. I'm fighting for the majority. Thank you. Thanks. Over here. Thank you, Congressman. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. My name is Ryan Williams. I'm a first year here planning on studying public policy and psychology. Um, and I'm really interested, no matter where I go in my life or on campus, seeing what the characteristics of leaders are. At this time, right now in the country, it seems like a lot of students are doing a lot of the real ground work and a lot of the grassroots it's, leadership, especially in Parkland. Yeah. So I was wondering, what advice do you have to all the students here, any high schoolers or even middle schoolers who feel politically inclined enough to go out and try to advocate for change in their communities? You know, you guys, you got to get involved. And I'm so glad you asked this question because I should have said this earlier. You know, it, it means a lot that you're here, but get involved. This is a really important time in our history and our politics. And you know, this is a tough job. It's not easy every day. You know, people say mean things about you all the time. Um, it's not easy on my wife. I mean, this is, it's, but it's, I'm so glad to be doing it because it's an important time to be involved. And you have a voice. You have a really important voice. Just see what these kids even younger than you are doing in Parkland right now. You know, they have a chance to change America because they're, they're using the freedom, the rights that we have as Americans and they're letting their voices be heard. So get involved in politics, you know, speak up. Voting is the bare minimum. Go volunteer for a campaign. Think about, think about running yourself. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what I did. And you know, sometimes people will tell you, ah, your voice doesn't matter, or you don't count. That's what I heard when I first ran, because I challenged the Democratic establishment in Massachusetts. Every Democratic politician, campaign against me, you know, many of whom are my friends right now, but they campaign against me. And, and what they were fundamentally saying was, Seth, do not participate in the democracy you just risked your life to defend. And that is really wrong. But I didn't listen to them. I got involved, and I'd like to think I'm able to make a difference, and, and you all can too. Hi, Congressman. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Miranda Wolford. I'm a first year planning on studying political science. Uh, in a similar strain to his question, we're seeing a lot of youth involvement, particularly on issues of gun control. How do you, when you either meet with constituents or hear from uh, media sources, balance the need for like imminent change and reassure your constituents while also being realistic about what you can actually accomplish in Congress right now? 
Well, it's a good question. I mean, we hear from constituents a lot. And, uh, and I actually did, in my first term, I did more town halls than any other Democrat in Congress, House or Senate. So I really believe in this. Like, I believe you've got to get out and have these conversations, um, you know, not just with a well-dressed group of people at, at Duke, but like, you know, your constituents and everything. Um, that's just a joke. Um, <laughs> you, you guys look great. Um, but it's really important because that's our, like, I work for them. They don't work for me. I work for them. I'm a public servant. You know, I'm supposed to represent their interests in, in Washington, so we've got we've to hear from them. Um, but, of course, you know, you have to, you know, there are some things that, that people, uh, you know, not everybody's top priority can be your top priority in Congress. There are so many different things that we have to deal with. And there are some things that are really important, but we just can't make forward progress on right now. I mean, I'm a big believer in campaign finance reform, but I'm not spending a lot of time working on it at this moment because we're just not going to get anything done in the Republican Congress. I truly wish that were different, um, but but there's a, just a political reality, and so you got to focus on what you can. I think the harder challenge right now is in this in this sort of Trump era in politics, when part of his strategy is to distract attention from things by having another scandal over here when we should be looking over there or whatever. Um, you know, the fact that he would try to drag the Russia investigation into the Parkland shooting—it's insane. Right? So how do we maintain focus on the things that matter? That, that's, that's challenging. One of the ways I do that is uh, you know, you'll occasionally see me on CNN or MSNBC or something, but we turn down nine out of every 10 invitations I get to go on cable because I'm just trying to focus on the issues that I think are most important. So they'll call all the time and say, hey, Seth, we want to hear your opinion on this. Well, no, no, you know, we'll wait. But that's kind of what you have to do to, to to counter what uh, what the president is trying to do against us. All right, thank you. Yeah. Hi, name's Brian, uh, second year MPP. First Great. off, appreciate the socks. Uh, and I'm going to ask you two specific questions. I thought questions. these were sort of Duke colors. I don't know. <laughs> you're almost you're almost there. Uh, first question: you, you talked about the insolvency of Social Security and how we're essentially going to go bankrupt in 2042. Yeah. So, what specific policies are you willing to stand behind to solve that problem? I.e. Are you going to increase the age? Are you going to uh, change the formula for Medicare uh, on that? And then second question is, uh, we are seeing a decrease in, or an increase in the civil military divide. We're seeing a lower uh, mm -hmm. rates in the military, under 0.5% now. What uh, policies are you going to look to push in Congress to increase that number and decrease that divide? Sure. So uh, on the first question, I think the first thing we should do with Social Security is raise, raise the cap. So that you know you're always contributing. You don't you don't sort of stop contributing more just because you make four hundred thousand dollars a year or whatever. Uh, we already did that with Medicare back in 1996. It's it's helped. I mean, there's no reason why we shouldn't do it with Social Security as well. It would, most estimates say, it would take care of about 80 percent of the the problem. Uh, should we have a conversation about raising the age? I think we should. Not for current retirees who you know have bought into a system that they they're expecting, but but maybe for future retirees. I think the nuance there is that you know for those for people who are working in white collar jobs, many of them will, wake, will work way beyond the retirement age that was expected when the program was set up in the 1930s. Um, but many people who are working blue collar jobs, you know, our bodies still break down and they will probably have to retire earlier. So we might have to have some thoughtful adjustments to what raising the retirement age might look like if we're gonna do it. But the bottom line is that you know we all need social security too. In fact, in my first campaign, I was speaking to this group in in, um, in Massachusetts, and they said, "Yeah, yeah, Seth, you know, we heard you're uh, open to changes in social security." And this is like you know, as a, Democrats are never supposed to say you're open to any changes in social security. And um, and they looked at me and they said, "Social security is going to be good for the next 25 years. Why would you want to change it?" And I was like, do you guys know how old I am? Like, that ain't going to work for me, <laughs> all right? Um, on the civil-military divide, uh, we do have a lot of work to do. And the, the best answer I think I have for you is that I'm a big believer in national service, in just giving young Americans, like all of you, the opportunity to serve your country if you want to. I don't think it should be mandated. But the last time I checked, there were five and a half AmeriCorps applicants for every one AmeriCorps slot. So there are a lot of Americans out there who want to serve their country and just don't have the opportunity. And, it doesn't have, and I don't think we should expand the military. I think the military is big enough. But there are a lot of places where we could use your help and where I think the whole country would benefit from your service. Yes, sir. 
Oh, that. hello, hello. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Congressman, for coming um, out tonight. Uh, my question, I've been hearing a lot about this evening and in general on the news about how the, um, the Democrat Party is going to reshape itself, and we talked about candidates and recruiting strategies and certain stuff like that. I guess my question is, the heart and soul of the Democratic Party is black people. So are we going to, is the Democratic Party going to stop taking black people's votes for granted? <laughs> I, I hope so, because, um, it, you know, we shouldn't be taking votes, Amer African Americans vote for, votes for granted at all. Um, and, you know, black Americans have been the most consistent supporters of the Democratic Party. I mean, you know, when you look at the Alabama election, I mean, you know, people say, oh, well, there are a bunch of white women who crossed the aisle to vote for Doug Jones. But also, let's give credit to the, you know, 96% or whatever of African-American women who just showed up faithfully and voted to put him over the line, right? And I absolutely think it's a mistake for us to just take that for granted. Um, so uh, we can talk a lot about what that means. Like, I, I, one of the issues we're working on in the office is criminal justice reform. You know, that's an issue that's important to a lot of African-American constituencies, and I think that we've just sort of taken it off the table because it's not politically convenient right now. We should be talking about that. And it's something that the bipartisan working group I'm a part of actually has talked about a lot. Uh, but look, you're right. We shouldn't be taking anybody's vote for granted. And if we, you know, make changes to the party, talk about broadening the tent, that doesn't mean shifting the tent. You know, it means maybe including some people who were in the Democratic tent before, we got to take care of everybody inside that tent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Lizzie Bond, and I'm a first year here at Duke, um, also studying political science. And I am one of the few Republicans in the room um, Thank tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, but I'm also one of those Republicans who feels disaffe disaffected by um, my party's politics right now. Mm -hmm. So my question for you, with your record of bipartisan leadership, um, what is the Republican Party that you would want to work with? Well, it's, um, that's a great question. I mean, part of me wants to just say, I hope they go farther to the right and you become a Democrat. But, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but not seriously. <laughs> um, no, thank you for the question. I, I want to work with a Republican Party that believes in facts. That's the most important thing. Because I know we're not going to always agree on everything, but we've got to be able to have an honest debate. If you can't even have an honest debate, you, you just can't get anything done. So that's the most important thing. I want to stop hearing Republicans always you know, just say, oh, where did you get that stat, the New York Times? It must be wrong. You know, that, that's not healthy for a democracy. And a lot of this comes from the current president, but it's being emulated by other politicians. And that's the biggest thing that we need to stop. Thanks. Thank Hi, Congressman. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, my you. name is Griffin Kennard, and I'm a second year uh, sophomore in the public policy program. And I'm from Missouri, um, which is middle America and a place where the Democrats have been slowly losing in. Um, and one of the biggest problems I think that middle America faces is the opioid cri crisis. Yeah. And I mean, the 114th Congress passed a bill that helped a little bit, but there are still a ton of people dying. There are people from my high school that I know that have passed away, unfortunately. And I just kind of want to know what you think should be done with the op opioid crisis. I mean, it is insane how many hundreds of thousands of Americans are dying from opioids. I mean, it's completely off the charts. And it, it, it affects everywhere in America. You know, I represent a very diverse district. I mean, we have, um, you know, a, a city like Lynn that's like pretty tough um, as, uh, you know, a real urban environment. And we have, I mean, how many people saw Manchester by the sea? If you haven't seen it, don't watch it if you don't want to get depressed, all right? It's like the most depressing movie I've ever seen. Um, but, uh, and by the way, it does not depict Manchester by the Sea at all. It depicts Gloucester, like right next door, which is, uh, which, you know, is a real, like a working class city. Um, Manchester by the Sea is a lot of hedge fund managers who have $25 million states on the water, all right? Manchester by the Sea has an opioid problem. So this is literally affecting everybody. But in general, what's happening is that there's some bipartisan work because, it, because it's a universal problem on coming up with good policy ideas and solutions, but then they never get funded. You know, And this is part of the tough reality. I mean, on, on the tax question, I didn't go into this. But part of the tough reality with this new tax bill 
is that it massively increases the federal deficit. So we can't pay for opioids right now. That's the biggest problem. We do not have the federal money to pay for opioids because it just went to a bunch of tax breaks for corporations. So that's the basic issue. Yes, there are some good ideas. There's even bipartisan cooperation, but we're not funding any of these programs. Thank you. Well, let me, let me, uh, let me end with a, 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 I guess a personal question, which is that you, you seem to love what you do. Um, and so, you know, all the students here, uh, Duke students have all kinds of options. Uh, and uh, you, by the way, you've already won the lottery. So you're, you know, you're, you, can, you can relax. You're gonna have a lot of options. Um, but uh, why should, you know, wh why, is, why is a life in public service satisfying? Why, what, 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 do you get, what do you get out of it? I, I hear, you know, we need you, and there's a sense of duty, but I also get the sense that you find it satisfying, that this is, this is uh, meaningful. Could you speak to that? You know, in a lot of ways, I didn't expect that when I started. Um, I talked a little bit about how I decided to start, sign up for the Marines. Part of it was a sense of guilt that I hadn't done anything to give back. And I really thought that I would sign up for the Marines, I would go and do my three and a half year commitment, and I would kind of check that box. And I'd never have to serve again if I didn't want to. So when someone asked me to be on you know, my daughter's PTA board or whatever, I'd be like, I I've done it. I I I'm good, all right? Well done. Good. And one of the biggest surprises was how much I missed it when I got out. I went straight to to business school. It was a tremendous opportunity, uh, an opportunity a lot of other veterans don't have. And, and I'd be sitting in a classroom just like this. This looks a lot like our business school classrooms. And, um, and God, I would feel like this is just so self-serving and meaningless being here. I'm just making myself smarter, increase my earning potential. You know, whereas a few months ago in Iraq, even in the war I disagree with, I was really, like literally saving lives, like truly making a difference in other people's lives. And, and that's at a very fundamental level why I decided to get back into public service. And, and make no mistake about it, like it's hard, you know? It's, it's hard to be a Marine. Right now it's hard to be a Congressman. Not as hard as being a Marine, but it's hard, you know? This isn't always an enjoyable job. You know, just check out my Twitter feed and look what people say about me. It's not always nice stuff. I, I screenshot the best ones to kind of keep me <laughs> humble, but... Um, <laughs> It's pretty unbelievable. Did your mother send them to you? You're, you're, you're oh, oh, God, no, I hope my, my mother, I really hope doesn't ever look at that. It's really, really bad stuff. I mean, I, had a, I got death threats from a cop last year. A cop sent me death threats on Twitter. He's apparently not a cop anymore, but. Um, <laughs> Probably not a good career move on his part, right? <laughs> well, I guess, and I, and, I, and I sort of didn't even handle it well. I, someone asked, well, how did you respond to that? I, said, I mean, I, I didn't think it was a big deal. I mean, he's not actually shooting at me, and that's been, you know, a prior experience in my life, so, you know, but other people took it seriously, and I probably didn't take it seriously enough. The actual literal answer is I responded with the eye roll emoji. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do that again. But, um, so, 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 I don't want anybody to be disillusioned to think that this is easy, but it is incredibly rewarding. Um, it's, there's, you know, I, I served in the Marines with some of the best Americans I've ever met in my life. And, um, you know, they were just amazing because they were willing to, I mean, you know, to, to, to meet some 18-year-old kid who never had any opportunity in his life and he's suddenly willing to, you know, to put his life on the line for, not just for the country, but literally for you, you know, mm -hmm. for some Harvard kid. You know, that's an extraordinary experience. You don't ever forget yeah. that. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about taking care of our vets, you know, and stay in touch with all the Marines I, I serve with as much as I can. And, 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 you know, it's not exactly the same being in Congress right now, but, but we help people every single day. Sometimes it's just the, the little stuff. It's just back in the district office when someone can't get um, their Social Security check, you know, or is getting discriminated against in a job or something. And we, we try to help, but... Um, I just, I, I just ask you guys to try it, because I think you'll find it rewarding. And this country needs more good public servants. It really does. You know, sometimes when I'm in, 
one of the most frightening things I have to do as a member of Congress on the Armed Services Committee is go into a really small room with a table of about you know just ten or twelve people sitting around the table and talk about um, you know our our most highest our, our, the mo most classified intelligence about North Korea, you know what we're doing about this. And there are times when I sit down at that table and I'm like, my God, how did I, how did I get here? You know why? I, I, I can't believe that this is partly on my shoulders to make this decision. Um, and then one of my colleagues will ask a question, and I'll say, thank God I'm here. <laughs> so we need better public servants, <laughs> right? We need, we need a new generation of leaders in this country. You know, we need smart people like you who have a lot of other options in life to come and, and do the right thing for America. So I hope many of you will try. Well, um, we may not all in this room agree with you uh, uh, on the, all the issues, but I think we're all agreed uh, that you really exemplify that spirit of public service. We honor you for your military service, and thank you for your, for your service to the country. So thank you. Thank uh, you, join me, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.